Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, October 27th, 2020, COVID update. I'll try to make it not so lengthy. We've had a few lengthy ones the last few days, and I'll try to be better. Uh, so numbers, we had 663 cases yesterday, which don't, doesn't make a lot of sense, but we'll um, just see what happens. Uh, we've had a few more deaths. Uh, we're very on pace for the surge. There were 74,000 more cases in the United States. The numbers internationally are amazing. So the big thing is we have weather. We have weather, and I kind of talked about this the uh, yesterday or the day before and you know weather is what this is about now this isn't about anything that's been done before there was always going to be a second wave fauci said i think yesterday or the day before that this is the continuation of the first wave that is not true and again anyone watching me still at this point from february you know fifth or sixth or whatever it was to now um, knows how i feel about him but the key concept was this was the predicted pattern was we were going to surge in April, which we did. It was going to get a little better, which it did. It then was going to increase in June, which it did a little bit worse than we thought. And that may have been somewhat because of the George Floyd stuff and a unanticipated cluster of all these 20 somethings getting some flexibility in their bar hopping, unfortunately. Um, but the death rate, but the number of deaths didn't skyrocket, even though the cases did. Then we expected a second case surge at the end of August and early September, which again, if you look back at what I talked about in the spring, this was the expected pattern. And then we were going to have the big surge now, and we're having the big surge now. That was always pre-programmed that in terms of what very smart epidemiologists were predicting so we're experiencing that now and so the part that again to get back to why the real method of protection is not masks even though i'm st i mean i still wear a mask every day i want everyone to wear a mask and using hand sanitizer again is very important but the bottom line is this if you're in Oklahoma City or you're in Arkansas or you're somewhere where we've had this ice storm and it's 32 to 30 degrees and it's a sleety, icy rain, you aren't outside. Okay, You're in buildings trying to work because you still have, people still have to work. I mean, we still see patients. We can't do all of our appointments via telemed. And let me be clear about something about telemed. It is not anywhere near as good for the patient as seeing them in person. If you think it's as good to see your doctor over a video medicine appointment, if you have a problem, you're not, you don't understand what we do. And most people want to see us in person. Now, I did a lot of telemedicine visits today for medication refills because there's markers like for ADD drugs. I have to see the person every three months. So yeah, those are totally fine. But if someone's having a problem, we need to see the patient, touch the patient, figure out what to do with the patient. I have several people who were in this last week who were having problems, not them, but family members, because their family members have complex medical issues and they haven't actually laid eyes on their physician in four or five, six months and they're doing these telemedicine visits. And I told them, make your significant other force the doctor to examine you and figure out why you're containing all this fluid and why you're having some elevation in your blood pressure and just chatting about it on the phone for seven minutes and them never seeing you is not effective. So, and that's a casualty of COVID. But the problem is when we're in these buildings, they're not ventilated to the point of an airplane or a casino and that's okay. They don't need to be. This is again, a one-off event for, for this century. So the problem is now we're in closed environments with poor circulation, and so the virus is gonna be easier spread. And so even if you're wearing a mask and washing your hands, it's still potentially on surfaces, and it's still potentially in the air. So that's why your immune system has to be up. So that's what I want everyone to think about. That's just a simple request. Get your immune system up. Get your immune system up. Get your immune system up and you're gonna have a much more challenging time getting sick. 
Because that's what the data shows. There's been four different papers or five different papers now between elevations in zinc showing decreases in hospitalization and elevations in alpha interferon levels, which is what zinc does besides killing the virus and decreasing inflammation. So again, that's just basic science being applied to COVID. So that's what I want you to do. So it's reasonable. Take a multivitamin. Just follow the RDA. If you just follow the, the RDA requirements, you're, you're three quarters of the way there. If you add a little extra zinc and some fish oil and actually blow off the RDA for vitamin D and go 5,000 a day, you're really going to be in a lot better shape for COVID. And if you have blood sugar problems, the vitamin D sensitizes your insulin receptors. The vitamin D does so much more than just COVID. So that is just simple stuff, do that. And it's not as bad of a disease issue. Because remember, 99% of people who get COVID don't get that sick. And so when we're figuring out how to manage this, it's targeted therapies to the higher risk groups, which is what we should be doing. And nutritional supplementation and focused interventions for lower risk groups. So that's my summary. and tonight. And just remember, if you're inside all the time, because it's winter, you're more at risk inside of getting the virus, even wearing a mask. So wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. That's the number one thing. So what questions are there today, Kim? So I guess you mentioned something about testosterone levels in COVID. So testosterone levels in COVID, there was a paper a long time ago from England that correlated that Essentially, 100% of the guys who, and, I, and I've mentioned this, and again, a lot of this literature I've already put on my website. I'm not going back to put it on for the 400th time. You need to go back and look yourselves or do a, go to PubMed and do a literature search and, and see if you can find it. I mean, I've put on stuff, but I'm not gonna routinely keep on putting on the same things over and over. But this is an older data set, and it was from like March or early April, when, and it was published after that, that essentially 100% of the people who went from serious illness to critical illness had low testosterone, and the guys who didn't had um, normal testosterone in this one trial. There was in a similar trial, it was the same thing with vitamin D. Testosterone is immune, aug is immune augmenter, per se. So if you're menopausal in a woman and you have low estrogen and low testosterone, your system isn't functioning as good as it would be if they had more normal levels, just like if you're a guy. If you have testosterone at a normal level, you're going to be functioning better. It's the way the body works. Hormones are a baseline thing for function. No hormones, poor function. It's that simple. How would you suggest people could encourage or support healthcare workers? How do we support healthcare workers? Is one, if you happen just to see someone in scrub somewhere, say, hey, thanks for helping. Now, nine out of 10 times, it's not gonna be someone who's actually taking care of COVID patients, but <laughs> it's still okay because people take are doing what they can and there's a big mental toll on everyone, not the least healthcare workers. Um, so that would be one thing. If you know anyone who's working at a hospital, whether they're a clerical person, a janitor, a carpenter, a doctor, a nurse practitioner, say thanks. I think that's how you support healthcare workers. And don't write stupid texts uh, criticizing the COVID response and belittling what they do. Because everyone who, because I get texts on this fairly frequently, about um, all the statistics wrong. Well, yeah, the statistics on total case numbers and stuff are wrong, but the statistics on who's in the hospital and how many sick people we have aren't wrong. There's a lot of sick Oklahomans and sick Americans and sick people in the world in the hospital. There are really too many to count. I mean, we just look at our office, which is just a little microcosm of of outpatient care. I mean, we're a gynecology wellness office. And sure, since I've done these talks, we get much more um, input or action on people with COVID who are in the practice. But I mean, we're seeing now a minimum of 20 to 30 every week in terms of telemedicine visits or exposures for infection, positive cultures and, and stuff. When it was in the peak in April, 
we weren't we were seeing you know a few a week now we're seeing every day several and there's questions every day from my PAs and nurse practitioners and what do we do with this person they're recovering and they're having this problem and so or this person's just getting sick do we need to add the dexamethasone we're doing that a, a large portion of every day for us is is those types of things and they're stressful for the healthcare providers who are actually doing it because they do it in the face of little uh, support from other physicians at times providers who are critical of doing outpatient care and then the federal government isn't supportive and no essential governmental agency is supportive so be nice to them so you've touched on this before but people are still confused there was a couple of questions if you get or are exposed to COVID and you're not very sick, does that mean you don't get as much immunity as if you were really sick? So the question, there's huge numbers of immunity questions. And this one is, if you get a mild illness, are you gonna get as much immunity as a severe illness? Well, the first thing with that is, when we look at the preliminary data neutralizing antibody levels, the theory is, and this is an FDA and NIH theory more than anything, that the neutralizing antibody levels that someone achieves who gets serious illness and then beats it off is, a, is a, an adequate amount to beat it off because they beat it off. So the question then becomes, if you have a lot lower antibody levels and beat it off very quickly, do you have the same level of immunity? Well, I don't think you can argue that they have less than this group because they beat it off with lower antibodies. I mean, the bottom line is when you look at vaccine data, there is almost no corollary to your antibody response in terms of then your immune or clinical event. So what the FDA and NIH are still doing is saying, well, we need this level to say they have immunity. That's not scientifically valid. So, because it's never been shown with vaccine data. I would go with, if you had an immune response with the initial virus, you probably have some level of protection for, and this is the problem, for some length of time. We don't know what it is. Classically, we're thinking at least four months to six months, but we don't know for sure. We do know that in every single virus like this, your beta lymphocytes get programmed to make antibodies to fight the virus. So everyone who gets infected with COVID and fights it off has trained a group of beta lymphocytes to make neutralizing antibody. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to fight it off. So those beta cells are there. They can reactivate. And the theory would usually be, up until now, <laughs> with COVID, that they would have some protection with those. So that's a question. If we look at how many recurrent cases there are now, it's somewhere between four and five, with only one person getting mild to moderately sick, and the other one's not getting sick at all. So once again, we're not seeing anything. What do we have to be concerned with? Everything, it's like we've thrown all common sense out. It's really basic <laughs> to me. And it's like, why doesn't anyone explain this? When do we have to be concerned about reinfection? Is it these cases? No, these are meaningless. It's nothing, it's baloney, it's hyperbole. If let's say in Tyler, Texas, when I'm just using Tyler, Texas, it could be Godibo, Oklahoma, or it could be Deerfield, Illinois. If you all of a sudden see reports that there's 40 people who were previously infected, all have gotten reinfected, that matters because it means there's a mutant and it's not just one person in Nevada and one person in Hong Kong and one person in Portland. It's a group of people who've been infected before are all getting reinfected again that means there's a true mutation causing reinfection that's significant. And that's what, that's what you need to be worried about and we all need to be worried about if it happens. But I mean, I wouldn't worry about it now because it hasn't happened. So if it happens, yes, then that's a big deal. It it's a game changer. We have to start thinking about immunity stuff in terms of people having it, then getting another infection. Likewise, the neutralizing antibodies that the vaccines are doing are gonna be totally meaningless too, so why would we ever do them? 
And so that's it. So there's this whole circular reasoning thing. If you're really thinking it through that, if there's no immunity with infection, there's no immunity with the vaccine. So it's a total waste of time. And that's what you have to understand. And so if you're in the camp that you think wearing a mask every day and a vaccine is going to save you, you're not following the science. It's nutrition, 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 nutrition is what you need to do. That's it. So I went a little long, but I want to try to talk about this immune thing. Those are unanswered questions. But again, the classic is if you get a viral infection, you don't get that virus again that season. I don't think that's going to change. But, you know, the thing to look for is a cluster of new cases in people in one locale because you're not going to have that same mutation occur at the same time in 10 different places that causes reinfection. It's going to be a cluster in one place first. Once that happens, we need to be concerned. But until that happens, we're still okay. So good night. Take care. And if you're in Oklahoma, I hope you have power and I hope you're warm and we'll get through this ice storm and this total explosion of trees. So take care.